Yes, I've included Alexis Ohanian, uh, founder of Reddit. We've had Alexis on. We've had Peter Maluth, who's, according to the Wall Street Journal, the number one wealth advisor in the United States. We've had Chris Sullivan on, the founder of Outback Steakhouse, who's a pretty active angel investor. We have Ryan Neese on our, uh, on our pod, who is a former NFL player turned, turned venture capitalist, which is a very unique background and was a great story. Uh, Jeff Vinnick, the owner of our Tampa Bay Lightning here locally, uh, who's also a very active angel investor. And uh, Jeff has won two Stanley Cups, as you probably all know. And Steve Raymond, who is a, a legend locally, uh, who took a company from pretty much zero to 35 billion. And not many entrepreneurs can say that. So that's some of our past guests. Before we get started with Hugh Campbell, uh, who uh, again, I'm very excited to have with us uh, here. Uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about Florida Funders. For those of you who might not be familiar with us, we're a cross between a venture capital fund or funds because we're on our third fund and a um, network of angel investors who uh, can invest alongside our fund in the, the deals we invest in. We are focused on early stage technology companies here in Florida and beyond. And we're, we like to say we're on a, a mission to change Florida from sunshine state to startup state. We want Florida to be known for technology and innovation and not tourism and oranges or strawberries. Mm -hmm. So with that, you welcome. Really, really excited you're with us today. Tom, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. You have a really uh, interesting background as I was uh, studying up on you and, <laughs> and uh, you know, a, a military guy turned entrepreneur. I want to hear all about that. Uh, I thought would start though, your company, you're the, the founder and CEO of AC4S Technologies. That's right. And uh, tell us a little bit uh, about your company and, and what you guys do. And you got to tell me where that name came from, because <laughs> I have to say it slowly every time I say it. It doesn't roll off my tongue. But. Well, I'll tell you, we're marketing geniuses. So that's where the name came from. <laughs> um, so AC4S Technologies uh, is the current company I'm running. It's a tech support business, uh, fairly traditional. Um, it's the latest thing I've been doing. Uh, AC4S is actually, it's a sister company to a company we sold a few years ago, about two and a half years ago. Uh, and that company was AC4S proper. And that was a federal sector business. And uh, C4 is a military acronym. Okay. Stands for Command Control Communications and Computers, which is essentially IT for the military. Okay. And as we were coming up with the name, we used... And, and again, in the federal sector, we wanted to be at the top of every list. So we needed an A. So we went, <laughs> mm, advanced C4, and then we were going to solve people's problems. So advanced C4 solutions. That's where it came from. It, it's a mouthful. So we shortened it to AC4S. This second company, a uh, sister company that's only private sector, no federal business at all, okay. uh, is kind of a spinoff of that company. Okay, well, that makes sense. All right, now let's go back to your your roots and uh, uh, you have a very interesting background and, and uh, I'm, thank you for your service to our country, by the way. Thank you, and, uh, I appreciate that. I'm glad you wore your West Point shirt. We were just talking about West Point's bucket list item of mine to visit West Point, which I hope to be doing in about a month for a fall football game. I love college football. Um, but uh, where did you grow up and how did you end up at West Point? And tell us about your journey. Yeah, so um, I'm originally from Connecticut, uh, born and raised there. Uh, my dad was a Methodist minister, so we, he got a new church every three to five years, so we moved around a bit, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we actually ended up, uh, my high school was split between Chicago and South Bend, Indiana, Notre Dame territory, Yeah. and uh, as I was, I was looking at schools, um, you know, you, you check the little box on your SAT form, and they send me brochures, so they send you all kinds of stuff, you know, and um, when I got to the packet for West Point, it was literally unlike anything else I had seen thus far. Uh, so it piqued my interest. Um, but quite honestly, when I got the package, it came in a brown envelope and it said, Department of the Army Headquarters, United States Military Academy, West Point, New York, which I didn't know anything about. I was six, seven, 16 years old at the time. And uh, my dad, came home one day and asked me, what's this? Uh -huh. And as a typical teenager, I, I said, I don't know. It's something from the army. I'm not going in the army. 
and summarily dismissed it. Um, he said, do me a favor, at least open it and read it. I said, okay, I will. <laughs> Typical teenager, week goes by, he asked me again, are you gonna, are you gonna open it? Yeah, dad, I'm gonna open it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, and then a, a couple days go by and mm -hmm. he asked me again. So I was like, okay, he's serious about this. So I did and it, I, I opened it and it was, you know, just an eye popping experience. And I said, this is not a regular college. Mm -hmm. So so your father knew a little something. He did. He did. <laughs> and I wasn't so sure about the military. Um, you know, I grew up in a very, you know, conservative household and, you know, religion based. You had better be dead to not go to church on Sunday. <laughs> so, um, so I wasn't really sure about the military. But once I went there and I studied the history, I'm a big history buff. Yeah. Uh, and I actually was on the ground there. I said, there's nothing I won't do to go to this school. Uh, that's that's neat and and i'm by the way i'm really looking forward when i go this fall to this tour of the museum i hear that's oh, yeah. spectacular i'm so excited it's a lot of history i love history as well so uh now when you were at west point did you study technology is that where you is that where you got into technology or was that later so um at the time west point only gave bachelor of science degrees in one of the engineering disciplines um I went down the engineering management track, which was managing technical people. Mm -hmm. So I figured I could do something with that. <laughs> yeah. And my minor was in double eight. So I figured electrical engineering was probably a good way to go. Okay. So you get out of West Point and go what do you do next? Go into the military, uh, 10 years active duty military, uh, which landed me here in Tampa at McNeil Air Force Base. Uh, in a specialized communications unit. So mm -hmm. I was a communications officer. I was applying what I actually learned in school, which is shocking, right? <laughs> um, and uh, I landed here at McDill Air Force Base. Cool. So uh, after you get out of the military, did you immediately start a company or did you go no, to the so, private sector first? So I went to the private sector. Uh, it was a great company called Intermedia Communications. You might remember that. Oh, I do remember that. Um, um, uh, Barbara Sampson founded that's that right. company. That's right. I'll she be. was a great local success story. This is going back a couple decades. Exactly. And right. she was ahead of her time. She was a female founder. That's right. Um, and she had such a presence about her. She was almost about six foot tall. Yep. Yep. And her brother's still here locally. Mm -hmm. I've kind of lost track. Is it Barbara? Is that her first yeah. name? Mm -hmm. that's yeah. Right. And uh, she took that company public. That's right. Um, and I think she was on like Oprah or something because she was so, so, you know, it was so unusual at that time for a female to be a young female she was like in her 20s she was and that was the go-go times of you know after the 1996 communications act which changed everything yeah um and so it was great organization it was a billion dollar organization five thousand employees i went to the engineering department after i got out of the military and at the time this was so long ago uh that was the big battle between atm and ip obviously ip won mm -hmm. the internet protocol so but yeah it was, it was a great time Good, good. Uh, and then after that, what did you do? So the story is how I became an entrepreneur. Yeah, I want to hear that. I tell people that I'm an accidental entrepreneur. <laughs> um, I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> well, so uh, my boss at the time, I was running all of the data networks in the engineering department. And my, my boss ran the internet division. And he lived in Maryland. Um, we had acquired that 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 company and uh, he was my boss to put all the data stuff together he left to go to a, a startup company uh, and i went into my senior vice president and said hey i want that job i know this network like the back of my hand and he told me you're too young and i was obviously a little disappointed with that <laughs> so i piss you off <laughs> So everybody in the company knew I was going to get that job, and um, they ended up giving it to an an, uh, an older gentleman, uh -huh. and uh, who knew nothing about the data networks. And uh, so word got out, and a couple people approached me. They said, "Hey, we're going to a startup company. We've got some venture capitalists out of New York City, Dolphin Equity Partners, and uh, we're looking for a vice president of engineering. Are you interested?" And I said, "Sign me up." Hey, yeah, I'm interested. <laughs> And uh, that was my, that was the, our first company that we started. Uh, it was a raw internet bandwidth company. And mm -hmm. we did it with uh, venture capitalists out of New York. 
And uh, how long how long did that company last? And well, when so, did you exit? So the the funny thing is that was very late in the the dot com bubble in that cycle. So, so late nineties. Yeah. Talking. So we we did late nineties and. By 2000, you know, we had 9-11, we had the dot-com bubble burst and all that. So the investors wanted to uh, pull back. And so we ended up selling that company uh, mostly 2002 and 2003. Mm -hmm. So, but it was, it was a fantastic experience. You know, we did okay. You know, I didn't make Mark Cuban money, as they say. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, I didn't have to work and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next. And we decided to do the next one with our own money. Mm -hmm. so, and, and, and that was the sister company to AC4S. That's exactly right. So uh, so we started AC4S. And you were mostly work, working on federal government or federal contracts? Yeah. And so my, I had three people approach me about starting a federal business, and I was not interested. Um, I had been in the military, I had been around the government, I was like, you know, I'm having all this fun out in the private sector, mm -hmm. making some good money, uh, learning a lot. Mm -hmm. And I said, why in the world would I ever go back into the federal sector? Um, but after the third person asked me, I said, you know, there might be something to this. Mm -hmm. So away we went. And we did pretty well. And that was focused on technology but so we end the technology what were we doing so we were doing uh it support for the military so it was very it was kind of a niche thing because um it was supporting joint operations where the army navy air force marines are all working together they all had different types of networks and trying to make it all work together uh it really was kind of tough back then back in those days and now, that, that was our niche. Now, how did how did West Point prepare in the military prepare you for being an entrepreneur? What lessons were you able to take from your military background into being a uh, an entrepreneur? Well, you know, because I think of them as very two different worlds, where one is very structured and command driven and top down, and one's more you know unstructured. No, and I, I crazy. I get, yeah, you I, never know what's coming at you. I, I get that, but you know, quite honestly, if you look at um, you know operations overseas and all the stuff that we're doing it's chaos mm -hmm. it really is and quite honestly i tell people all the time that um particularly in the last company it was fairly sizable um that i i applied everything i ever learned um managing mm -hmm. people managing the technology solving problems i always say attack the problem mm -hmm. um those kinds of things you know being very aggressive and 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 all those things and yeah you know you're constantly making decisions and you don't have all the information. Mm. What does that sound like? <laughs> that sounds like life of an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, so. I think our founders can all relate to that. Absolutely, right? You wish you had every scrap of information. It's just not there. Yeah. So you've done you've done venture capital back mm -hmm. and then you've done it without VC money doing it on your own. That's correct. Uh, what are the differences there? And what would you recommend to founders? Or mm -hmm. Most of our young founders are out there you know, especially our younger ones, they don't have any money, so they, they probably don't have much of a choice. But That's right. Well, I will tell you that, and you know, it's radically different, I believe, now than it was, you know, 20 years ago. Now there's there's capital everywhere. Oh, my gosh. And everybody's trying to deploy it and, you know, get that, you know, significant return on investment, ROI. Um, so if, if you're going to go out and raise capital, just understand that you're now subject to... Um, you know, whoever you're, you're, you're partnering with. And I tell people, make sure you may just be looking for your next buck uh, to, to fund your dreams, your goals, your aspirations, all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, but you really need to spend some time interviewing the, the other side of the table and figure out what is it they want and what's, you know, how are they going to operate and those types of things. Sure, they're all driven by ROI and everybody wants to make, you know, a billion dollars or whatever, but it's how they're going to interact with you, you know, what is, yeah, what, what they're going to expect. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, There's it's, a wonderful book out and I've been uh, listening to it on, on uh, audio called The Secrets of Sand Hill Road, which mm -hmm. is written by one of the managing partners in Andreessen Horowitz. Mm -hmm. highly, I forget his name, but highly recommend it. But for founders, it really gives you what you just said, the perspective of, what's it like to be on the other side and what are they looking for 
That's right. And if you're as a founder, if you understand that, you're going to be ahead of the game. I think that's 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 wise advice. And I will tell you that you know most of the time, it, you know, if you've not, if it's your first time out of the gate, you know, you're worried about funding your dream and however that's going to happen. Yeah. And you may not have the ecosystem, the support system to guide you down the path of you know taking that sage advice, right? So this is a fantastic way to get that that, that kind of a lesson. Yeah, and I would I would um, counsel entrepreneurs and founders that hey, before you take money from any venture capitalists, including Florida funders, is and you want to you want to realize you're getting into business with these people. It's a partnership. You want to you want to feel good about them and feel that they're that it's a good fit. I mean, we do that all the time where we pass on companies. It's not we didn't like the company. We just didn't think it was a good fit. We could add any value. We sure. maybe understand what they were doing. It was outside of our swim lane or wheelhouse or whatever you want to call it. But I think on the founder side, it's the same thing. You you want to find the if you have options. <laughs> if, if you, you have, have a good idea and a good team, hopefully you have some <laughs> options. You want to take money from the people that are going to be able to help you the most. That's right. That's right. And, and you, everybody's aligned. We know what's going to be, what's going to happen, you know, because it's not always going to be up and to the right. It's going to be bumpy. And so, oh, yeah. you know, Amen to what, that. what happens when it's bumpy, right? I wasn't raised by, raised by a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> That's, right. That's right. So, yeah, no, we, we talk about this all the time, you know, founders, it's, you know, being an entrepreneur, it's not for the faint of heart. You're going to get kicked in the teeth. You're going to get knocked down. It's part of it. You're going to have really bad days. You're going to have really good days. It's, mm -hmm. you know, like you said, it's not linear. It's up and down. And then, you know, obviously, as an entrepreneur, you're going to have to pivot sometimes. Maybe that idea wasn't quite right. The market's not ready for it. You're going to have to pivot. And you think we need to be going this direction. You go pitch that to the board and the investors and they're like, nah, I don't think that's a good idea. So what happens then, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you've got you've got their money. <laughs> so yeah. I I <laughs> I would say here, you know, this is kind of anecdotally, I don't have the scientific evidence, that probably half the companies we invest in end up pivoting mm -hmm. uh, or something close to that. And I think there's some probably industry stats on that. But it's that's one of the reasons we look so closely at the entrepreneur, not just the problem they're solving or what they're solution is because we know that what we're investing in may not be what they end up doing, especially if they're a resilient entrepreneur and, you know, persevere and the kind of people we like to invest in. And I will tell you, I think, you know, being an entrepreneur, I think the, one of the biggest things that you do, you know, it's a team sport. So you, you have to be that coach. You know, I often talk about draft, draft picks, you got this many things you need. You need some offense. You need some defense. You mm -hmm. need some special teams, but you don't have all the money in the world. So you yeah. have to prioritize your draft picks and get the right team of people around you to execute on the dream. And I think I would say that's probably one of the things that I learned in the military is the most important thing is, you know, when I was at McDill Air Force Base, I would not go on a mission unless I had a Navy tech with me because those guys would go out on ships in the middle of the ocean and fix stuff <laughs> you just invited to call and bring you you know yeah. they gotta fix it and so i quickly learned after the first couple missions uh -huh. that i was never going anywhere without a navy tech <laughs> yeah there, you know you, you said that it's a team sport and business certainly is and one of the things that we look for in founders and it's, i think is really helpful for you founders out there is self-awareness mm -hmm. you can't be good at everything and you want to make sure the people you surround yourself with compliment you. That's exactly and right. Make up for your weaknesses. That's but exactly it takes right. self-awareness to realize you even have weaknesses and build that team. Because a lot of folks have had some level of success and they're like, okay, I'm gonna go out and start this company and I'm it, I'm the man. Well, you know, you need a team. It's yeah. a team sport. Good. Okay, I'm going to pivot here a little bit with Let's our conversation. It. Let's pivot. Uh, one of the things that's been very uh, topical in venture capital for really a couple of years is minority investing. Mm -hmm. And um, as, a, as a venture capitalist, I can tell you that I think the industry and certainly Florida funders, we would love to invest in more female founders, more black founders, more Hispanic founders, more minority founders. And, we, and we've invested in, in quite a few. I think the, the one industry stat I saw not long ago was about 1% of all the venture capital-backed companies in America 
are run uh, by by an African American black uh, a black founder, mm -hmm. where it's about twelve percent of the population. So obviously that's that's out of kilter. Yep. Um, as as a black founder, what advice do you have for venture capitalists like us and like me? How do we? How can we invest more in minority founders? Well, I think uh, yeah, it's a very difficult problem. Um, but I think the biggest issue right up front is two things. Um, quite often, most of, you know, ninety nine percent of the times, it'll be their first time. So, are they polished? Do they have everything that you would normally expect in somebody coming in looking for capital? They may not, mm -hmm. and so. Um, you know, it's important to get them to the right coaching so that they can be ready for capital. So here, the great thing, with Florida funders and what some of you guys have done in this community is just fantastic is we now have an ecosystem and we have Tampa Bay Wave, we have the Tampa Bay Innovation Center, we have Embark Collective, all these places where those, those folks can get the coaching they need. You know, I've got a great, I was just talking to a, a, a kid that I'm mentoring yesterday and he was showing me his product and it's great. Okay. But let's talk about how you pitch it, mm -hmm. right? When you get in front of somebody. So um, these are the questions they're going to ask you. Have you thought about this? Have you, you know, so you, they need that coaching that they may or may not have access to. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they're like everybody else. They'll have the ideas. They'll have the, the hopes and dreams and the desires to change the world. Um, but they may not look, you know, uh, the, the kid I was mentoring yesterday, um, you know, his dreadlocks and a beard. And my initial reaction is, okay, we're going to have to clean that up, right? Because, <laughs> you know, because I mean, let's be honest, uh, you know, it, it, it can put some people off. And mm -hmm. do you want that to stand in the way of, you know, $10 million or $20 million, whatever it is? Um, my young nephew that just graduated from Morehouse College, the college that Martin Luther King went to, you know. I didn't know that. He, um, you know, he said, you know, I told him he needs to shave his facial hair. And he was like, I'm not doing that. I was like, well, that's a conscious decision. That may have implications on, he, want, he wants to run for office and all those other things. Uh -huh. And I, I gave him the examples of, look at, African-American men that have been very successful in our society are typically clean shaven. Mm -hmm. So I can't I, say anything. <laughs> I'm not clean shaven. I, it's, it's an example yeah. of, you know. No, I know exactly what you're saying. I have a little brother with big brothers, big sisters. I've mm -hmm. had him for 10 years. He's yep. 19 years old and I'm working with him on a bunch of different things, but one of them is to get a job, mm -hmm. right? Because he lives at home with his mom. His mother does not make a lot of money and she really could use the financial help and it's time for, he does that. Yep. He's not in school anymore. And he has this hair that is just <laughs> the craziest thing. I'm like, <laughs> and well, and his name's like, Romeo. I'm like, Romeo, I think we got to start with a haircut. Here, buddy. <laughs> let's, let's start there. Right. But, you know, having those difficult conversations, you know, for those, I'll say kids, um, those young entrepreneurs, you know, they feel that's part of their, their identity. Yeah, and so you're asking them to change their identity. It's like it's kind of a big deal to young people. Yeah, um, for us older guys, you know, yeah, whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I can relate to that. I mean, I I remember that, and I think I've told this story before in one of my other podcasts. Is you know, the sorry, the 19 year old kid. He comes in. He's he's unshaven. He's got long hair. He smells because he doesn't bathe. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have shoes on, and he he pitches this this investor on give him, give him, a, give him a couple hundred thousand dollars. He's going to change the world. That was Stephen Jobs talking to Mark McCola and, you know, who would have given him and he gave him the money and the rest is history. Right. So, right. but the other thing I think on our side, this is just my personal observation is we don't see enough black founders. Mm -hmm. We don't see, we love to see more. And I think some of that's cultural and it's, it's starting to change it and it's starting to change with women. We're, we're seeing more women founders, which is exciting. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, my, I have a daughter mm -hmm. and I'm, I know she wants to be an entrepreneur someday. And, you know, that's, that takes time. And that, and that's something that starts young. So the younger we can get to kids and realize that, Hey, entrepreneurship is a, is a, 
is a, a you know a, a potential future for you. And I think some of these celebrity investors. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Jay Z was I, he had a killer year last year. Oh my gosh! I had yeah. Oatly hit and a cannabis company and and uh, you know and and yeah. seeing more athletes invest. I think is all going to help them too. I think that's true as well. And uh, you know, I think Jay Z is like a billionaire now. But um, I think all of those things are true. And I think it's imperative, you know, quite honestly, just like you said, to get to those younger, younger kids to show them that there is a different way, yeah. <clears throat> you know, to be successful. I mean, clearly the internet and Instagram and YouTubers and all those things have, have really opened up, um, you know, a path to wealth uh, for lots of folks that didn't exist 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, but, you know, certainly being an entrepreneur is, is, you know, it changes everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and, you know, obviously Florida Funders, we're big fans of entrepreneurship. I mean, that's really our whole mission. And if you think about what makes this country great, um, it's things like our military. It's also things like entrepreneurship. It's, it's really what makes us in many ways the envy of the world. And, you know, people can come here and they can start a company and that's, that's one of the things we talk about Florida funders. We want our best and brightest entrepreneurs coming to Florida to start their companies. And we don't want our best and brightest entrepreneurs going somewhere else. But mm -hmm. that's what, you know, those, those entrepreneurs are really the ones that in many ways are going to change the world. Dude, I have traveled many places around the world and there's many, many places you simply cannot change your status in life. And that's wholly possible here. Yeah. If you're willing to work, commit, you know, you know, certainly there, it's, not, it's not perfect, but, you know, it's a hell of a lot better than lots of other places. <laughs> so true. So true. Well, uh, you know, this has been great. Uh, maybe I'd close with asking you if there's one piece of advice you'd like to give to uh, other founders, young founders that are out there that um, you'd like to leave them with. Um, I think I would go back and, and, and tell young founders that, again, it's a team sport. Pick the right team. Um, that is so critical in executing on your dream. You've got to have the right people around the table, all rowing in the same direction to, to execute the dream. That's probably the biggest thing. If you do that, most everything else is possible. This has been great. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. It's continued success to uh, our founders out there. If they want to get a hold of you, do you mind? Oh, no, absolutely. I'm easy to find. You know, I'm out there on LinkedIn. Just come find me. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm willing to talk to just about everybody. Good. That's awesome. If you want to learn more about Florida Funders, if you're a founder, you can go out to our website and apply for funding. It's a very simple process. Take you about 10 minutes. We're floridafunders.com. And if you're an investor and you want to learn more about investing in Florida Funders and the companies we invest in, uh, go to our website. And if you want to reach me, I'm Tom at floridafunders.com. Uh, Thank you so much.